It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. They have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. For but what we need to do is we need to work with our partners like the Japanese and the Americans because there is strength in numbers. If you look at the G7, it represents 50% of GDP. What, I, what I've done, and I did this in Liverpool, where we had our G7 meeting last year, is encouraged our counterparts to work together. So we should look at making sure we're not exporting technology that could be used against us. We need clear investment screening, and we've developed that to make sure that we can't have acquisitions of key strategic assets. And we need to be clear that we should not become strategically dependent on China. In the way that Europe became on Russia, and they've used it as leverage against Europe in terms of things like turning off the gas. What we're also doing is working with our G7 counterparts on our alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative. Because at the moment, what China is doing is it's investing in developing countries, it's creating debt, and it's using that to try and have greater global influence. So, we need to work together with freedom-loving democracies to counter that and to make sure we're investing into those countries, but that also we're not becoming strategically dependent on China. There's a gentleman here in a fabulous jacket. Hello, sorry, Connor Aston. I'm just wondering how you could potentially fix the benefit system. Um, if we take a single parent working, uh, it gets to the stage now as a small business owner that people can't afford. If they work more than 16 hours a mm. week, they start to affect their benefits and they, they then can't afford to do that. And as a small business owner, it makes it much more difficult for us to recruit people. So how, how could you see to reward people to work rather than to not work? Well, you, you make a very good point. So there's there's a large number of people now across the United Kingdom who are economically inactive. And what we need to do is encourage those people into work. And we're also facing businesses that have a skills shortage at the same time. And it is about changing the incentives in the benefit system. And that is what I would seek to do over time to get more people into work, but also creating the jobs and the opportunities that uh, that people can work in. And that's why it's important that we keep taxes low, re reverse the national insurance increase. So we help businesses thrive, but we're also helping people get those jobs by making the incentives in the benefit system much clearer. Great. 
Um, the gentleman here at the front, if we can get a microphone now, just bear, bear with me. So it is coming round to you. <coughs> Jack Irwin, North Down. We have a huge deficit. Um, is reducing uh, taxation uh, the right way forward or not to, to, to service that debt? So we have the highest levels of tax for 70 years. And it's my view that if you put taxes up too high, you actually get less revenue in because businesses are less likely to invest, people are less likely to set up new companies, people are less likely to go into work if there aren't clear benefits to doing so. And I think we've got to the stage in our economy where taxes are too high and they're potentially choking off growth. Currently, we're projected to have a recession. And I don't need to tell you that if we have a recession, it's going to be harder to pay the deficit off. Now, of course, over time, we need to make sure the private sector is growing faster than the public sector. And we're bringing those revenues in. But it's my judgment that our taxes are too high and they're actually stopping that economic activity that will help pay off our debt and pay off our deficit over time. Um, <laughs> we've come to the gentleman, um, gentleman here. Microphone's coming to you, sir. Hello, um, Alan Thompson, Carrick Fergus. If elected, what measures would you take from day one to bring to an end the, the fiasco in the English Channel? So, I, I fully support uh, the Rwanda scheme and I worked with Priti Patel on that. I want to expand that scheme to more countries. It is the right solution because what it ultimately means is there is somewhere that, that people can live and work in the long term, and it's a, it is a long-term sustainable solution. The problem we have is the ECHR trying to overrule the decisions made in Britain, and the way I would deal with that is immediately legislating to make sure that the ECHR can't overrule our domestic decisions. Um. Central Isle, this gentleman here with glasses on, if the um, microphone is coming to you, sir, bear with us. Hi, I'm Jack from uh, Belfast. Um, hi. hi. Um, you have supported a Prime Minister that has continually lied to the Queen, Parliament and the entire United Kingdom. Therefore, does this not bring into question your own personal integrity and honesty? Well, I don't, I don't agree with that. Boris Johnson has been an excellent Prime Minister. He delivered, he delivered on Brexit. He delivered on Brexit. He delivered on the COVID vaccine. And he delivered on standing up to Vladimir Putin and backing the Ukrainians. And I'm, I'm proud of what he did. And what we need to do now is we need to deliver on the promises we made in 2019 to people across the United Kingdom. And that is what I am determined to do. Fantastic. Um, final question. We're going to go with the lady with the scarf on here, if the microphone can come down. Liz, you're so welcome to Northern Ireland. Um, we have a great country here, so much going for it. We just need to get it into the right hands. Uh, I'm just going to come back on you again about democracy returning to Northern Ireland. Um, in as my friend mentioned about the abortion issue, um, in 2019, it was the Northern Ireland Executive uh, Formation Act that allowed the Secretary of State at the time to bring in this abortion law. Now, you mentioned that you would want things to be the same right across the UK, but it's not the same, Liz. We have an extremely severe abortion law here in Northern Ireland, um, one of the most extreme in the world. I'm a retired occupational therapist, and I'm very concerned that uh, babies with club foot and hair lip uh, both can have moder uh, modern surgical procedures to correct that are being aborted. Also, that many uh, babies with learning disability um, are, are um, being aborted, and we're a bit deprived 
of people with learning disability in our community that can be so, so wonderful. Um, now, and there's another issue regarding um, sex education, so I'll have to shorten and come to the point. But what can you do uh, to repeal um, Section 9? Um, so that uh, true democracy will be returned to Northern Ireland and we can uh, even link in with the UK on this, whereas at the case uh, we're not uh, at the same level. Well, the, I mean, the, they're, they're slightly different issues because the, the issue of, an abortion, of abortion is an issue of conscience for members of Parliament. And I do believe that should be decided at a UK level. I think that is the right approach. I mean, on the issue of sex education, uh, that is a different issue that does need to apply specifically in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you please put your hands together for Liz Truss? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and can I just uh, reiterate the point about short questions. The shorter the questions, the more people we will get through. Um, will you please now get ready and give a warm welcome to our second candidate, Rishi Sunak. Good afternoon, my fellow Britons. Thank you for having me. Now, look, I'm standing here in front of you today for one very simple reason, and it's because our country, our United Kingdom, did something extraordinary for my family. It welcomed them here as immigrants 60 years ago and allowed them to build a better life. Now, I was raised with a few simple values. Foremost among those is that family means everything to me, and that's because we all know that the bonds of family are far greater than anything any government could ever hope to replicate. Now, in my family, the thing that we prioritised, above all, was hard work as the way to forge ahead. My mum ran the local chemist in Southampton, where I grew up, and I spent my time working for her in the shop, out and about delivering medicines to local patients, but also doing her books, seeing the power of that small business to provide jobs and opportunity in our local community. Now, for my parents, there was one thing above all that they believed could provide a better future for their three children, and it was simple. It was through education. And that's why today I passionately believe that the best way that we reduce inequality, that we spread opportunity, that we transform people's lives, is by ensuring that the birthright of every child is a world-class education. And that, in a nutshell, are my values. Patriotism, family, service, hard work. And I know that they will be your values too, and that's because they're conservative values. And that's why I want to be your Prime Minister, to put those values into action to build a better Britain. But how are we going to do that? Well, we need to do three things. First, we must restore trust. We need to rebuild the economy, and we need to reunite our country. Now, when it comes to restoring trust, for me, that starts with honesty. And as you can see in this leadership race, I've not chosen to say the things that people may want to hear. I've said the things that our country, I believe, needs to hear. Now, even though that doesn't make my life easy, it is honest, and that is what leadership is all about. But we'll also restore trust by delivering on the things that matter to people. And that's why I want to stand up for our values and take on this lefty woke culture that seems to want to cancel our history, our values, and our women. It's why I want to make sure that we finally tackle illegal migration. Because I stand here as a product of our country's compassionate history in welcoming people. But it must be done fairly. It must be done legally. And when we see screens, scenes on our TV screens of people coming here illegally, it undermines trust in the system. And with my plan, Radical as it is, we will fix that problem and take back proper control of our borders. But we also need to restore trust right here in Northern Ireland. Because all you know, 
that Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom is being threatened. Now, the Reverend McMullen had a wonderful anecdote about David Trimble at his funeral, where he talked about the night of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, how David forgot his PIN number for his card and couldn't buy some food when he went out shopping. But we also know that David never forgot the details when it came to negotiation. And as a proud Briton, Unionist and Ulsterman, the detail that he was most proud of when it came to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was Strand 3, the East-West relationship, because he knew that that would be the counterbalance to what the nationalists were after, and he had enormous foresight in making sure that that was an integral part of the agreement, and you know as I know that that is under threat today. And I want to give you my commitment that I will do what it takes to fix the protocol and protect Northern Ireland's place in our United Kingdom. When it comes to rebuilding the economy, you don't need me to tell you what the problem is. We saw it today in the figures. It's inflation. And we've seen this story before. Inflation is the enemy. It makes everyone poorer. It eats into people's savings, their pensions. It pushes up mortgage rates. That's why this autumn and winter, as Prime Minister, I'll make sure that we support especially the most vulnerable in our society with the means to help get through what will be a difficult time, because that's the compassionate conservative thing to do. But what I will not do is pursue policies that risk making inflation far worse and lasting far longer, because that is not going to help anyone. And especially if those policies seem to amount to borrowing 50 billion pounds and putting that on the country's credit card, then asking our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tab. Because for me, that's not right. It's not responsible. And it is certainly not conservative. Yeah. But I am going to cut taxes. And in this parliament, for the first time in 16 years with my plans, we will cut income tax. Because I want to demonstrate that under a conservative government that I lead, hard work will always pay. But I'm going to do that responsibly by being tough on public spending and by growing our economy. Which is why this autumn I want to radically change how we tax businesses. <clears throat> Cutting taxes for those businesses that are doing the right thing and investing and innovating, because that's how you drive growth and productivity in a modern econ economy. But I also want to support our fantastic industries here, because there is so much potential, not just in the small businesses that dominate Northern Ireland's economy like my mum's, but also in the industries of the future, with hydrogen buses coming on the streets, with the Space Propulsion Centre, with Thales, with City here, with the financial services industry. I know how to turbocharge those industries. I was radical as Chancellor. I will be radical as Prime Minister, reforming our financial services regulation, making sure that we create the innovation economy of the future, spreading R&D across the UK creating a new free port right here in Northern Ireland, a Brexit opportunity that I came up with. Now, I know with my business experience, I can lead not just Northern Ireland's economy, but the UK's economy into the future and seize those opportunities that are there waiting for us if we're prepared to be bold and radical about grasping them. Because in two years, we need to reunite our country at a general election. And we have to do something that has never been done before. We have to make British political history by winning a fifth general election in a row. Now, even, even though it hasn't been done, I am confident that working together, all of us, we can do it. But it's going to require us to appeal to swing voters everywhere. And we need to start right here, because it's right that the Conservative and Unionist Party puts resources and candidates in every part of our United Kingdom because we want to win in every part of our United Kingdom. But in order to that, win that election, we will have to appeal to people everywhere. And I am passionate that I am the candidate that offers our party the best opportunity of securing that election victory and ensuring that Keir Starmer never walk through the doors of number 10 Downing Street. 
And in conclusion, I'll just say this. You saw me as Chancellor at the beginning of the pandemic, acting boldly, radically, to successfully safeguard our economy through the biggest storm it had experienced in 300 years. Now, as Prime Minister, I promise you that I will apply that same sense of urgency and grip to everything else that government does as we create a better Britain. A Britain where our children can walk safely on the streets at night. A Britain where the NHS is reformed and efficient and there for us when we need. A Britain where our schools and apprenticeships are the envy of the world in providing opportunity. And a Britain where our economy is the most dynamic it has ever been with our businesses investing and innovating to create jobs in every part of our country. But I also promise you this, perhaps more importantly, that I will give you my all to ensure that each and every one of you here today can always feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. So I humbly ask for your support, not just to be our next party leader, but also the next Prime Minister of our great United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Right. Uh, right, we're straight into questions. Once again, if you can raise uh, your hands. There's a lady uh, down here. We'll go for the lady on the end, first of all. If uh, the microphone is coming down to you uh, now. Hi, Lynn Anderson, East Belfast. How exactly are you going to sort out the NHS issues? GPs working part-time, lack of GPs, intakes not um, managing to take over those leaving. I'm a former nurse and I've seen all the issues firsthand. On Sunday night, there were two emergency psychiatric yep. beds, but they were mattresses on the floor. What are you going to do? Yeah. So, Lynn, the, the NHS is the country's number one priority, and it's clearly under strain. And if we want to be a government that cuts taxes, and I desperately want to deliver tax cuts for you and everyone else in the country, we have to be prepared to be bold about the NHS. Because if we are not, if we're not prepared to do things differently, the NHS will continue to swallow up every pound that every one of you here and everyone else has, right? And I think we as Conservatives need to try and change that dynamic. We need to reform and make the NHS more efficient so we can talk less about how much money we're always putting into it and more about the health care that we're getting out of it. So I'm, going to prepare, I'm prepared to be very, very radical about these things. And I'll give you just one example so you get a sense that I've been thinking about this. And that's to tackle an issue which has bedeviled us for years and we haven't done anything about. And that is the issue of missed NHS appointments. Now, last year, across the NHS, there were 15 million appointments that were missed, not just at GPs, but at hospitals, too. And that's not right. It doesn't value our doctors and nurses. And worse, it deprives people of the care that they desperately and urgently need. So my plan is to get tough on people who are missing appointments. Because if we do that, it's not about making money from them. It's about changing behavior in this country, so that's not acceptable. Because if people cancel those appointments in advance, we will free up an enormous amount of extra health care, which means people can get seen quicker. They won't be waiting. We'll get the backlogs down faster without a single one of you or anyone else having to pay a penny more in taxes. And yes, lots of people will say, oh, well, you can't be tough on people, and there's always a good excuse, or how will you get the charging to work? But no, right? We've got to do things differently and take on these conventions. Because if we don't, if we're not prepared to be bold and radical, about getting efficiency out of the NHS, not only will we not get the health care that we need and deserve, we will never be able to cut taxes. And I want to do both of those things, so that's what I'm going to deliver for you as Prime Minister. Um, there's a lady just here. Hi, uh, Leslie McGarrity, North Down. I'm a social care provider of over 30 years standing, and I have never known it to be so difficult to deliver social care. 
there are two aspects to my question. The first one is in relation to uh, benefits that uh, prevent people from working or permit them not to work. And secondly, in relation to immigration costs for uh, social care businesses. Uh, presently, we are unable to retain staff, recruit staff who are currently on universal credit. Uh, we can't improve their terms and conditions because then it reduces their benefits. Uh, would there be mileage, perhaps, in increasing the number of hours that people have to work in order to obtain universal credit? And secondly, I have to pay £3,500 to the Home Office to bring staff from overseas. These staff will be doing work for the NHS or the public sector whilst they're employed by me. Is that fair? So it's an excellent question because some of the challenges that you're seeing in social care are being felt across the economy and many of you will run small businesses and what's the number one challenge other than energy costs? It's getting access to workers and getting people to actually work. And I strongly believe that part of the answer to this problem is being much tougher on our welfare system to get people off benefits and into work. Now, I'll tell you this, right now, there are more people claiming unemployment benefit than there are job vacancies in the economy. I mean, just think about that for a second. And that's happening under a Conservative government. That's clearly not right. Something's gone wrong. Now, I think there are one or two very specific things we can do to change. Now, actually, your idea is similar to one that I'm going to put in place. Right now, if you're on unemployment benefit and you work just nine hours on the <coughs> national living wage, at that point, you don't have to check in as much with your job coach at the job centre. You don't have to take the extra hours that may be on offer or an extra job and you can keep your benefits, nothing happens to you. I don't think that's right, right? Because ultimately it's your taxes and someone who's working very hard's taxes that are paying for that. And if there are hours to do, if there's a job going, people should have to take the job as opposed to just being able to stay on benefits. And that's the change that I want to bring because I do think that is the right thing. It's the conservative thing. Those are our values. We believe in working hard. Right? And we want to support people off welfare into work because it's good for them and their families too because there's dignity in work. I passionately believe that. And it's fair for taxpayers and it's good for the economy because it will ease inflation. So it's something I want to be very robust on and quickly because it's the right thing to do. But as long as we're doing that and as long as we're being tough on illegal migration, which I talked about in my speech, which we must do and I will do, then I think it's right that we are pragmatic about migration for those sectors of our economy that need support. So whether that may well be in agriculture or social care where we have, as you know, put social care workers on the immigration shortage list, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be pragmatic because Brexit for me, and I voted for Brexit proudly, was about having control over our borders. Not saying that no one should ever come here, but making sure that everyone who did come here comes here for a reason that we decided. That's what sovereignty means, and that's the kind of country and immigration system and welfare system that I want to deliver as Prime Minister. Um, the gentleman next to the gentleman who's holding up a handkerchief, a middle row. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, Edmund, uh, Edmund Chen. Um, you UNSDI, SDI under the United Nations. I'm from Hong Kong. Hi, welcome here. And thanks for um, being here. Um, nowadays, um, I believe that Putin is not quite strong as some half year ago. We all believe that. But our greatest uh, flat, maybe, still, Beijing. Xi Jinping got 65% getting away in uh, October, end of October, if you believe me. And regardless of that, there are something called transcendental warfare. I don't know whether uh, we are all ready for that, including... Question, sir, please. Yep, including um, the war now, including Hong Kong, and including the um, Taiwan... Uh, Taiwan technology, semiconductor, are we ready to counter Beijing? Yes. Well, look, sir, I agree with you, and I've said so previously, that China represents, and the Chinese Communist Party represent 
the greatest threat to our economic security and indeed our national security. That's something that the head of MI5 and the FBI also affirmed in a recent speech that they jointly gave. And you're right as well that that threat manifests itself in lots of different ways and in new ways to those that we were used to dealing with in the past. So, well, how do we deal with it? I think there are a number of things that I will leave with you. Uh, first of all, you mentioned investment, and that's right. Now, it's a great strength of our economy that we are open to international investment, and it has driven jobs, growth, and productivity, which you all know here in Northern Ireland. But it's also right that we are able to protect ourselves against hostile investment that seeks to steal our technology, infiltrate our companies. And that's why, as Chancellor, I was proud to pass a new law, the National Security Investment Act, which gives us new powers to stop that type of hostile investment from happening. As Prime Minister, I would absolutely use the powers in that bill to keep us all safe. But we need to do a few other things. We need to always stand up for our values, particularly with regard to Hong Kong, as you said. And that's why I talked about our country's proud, compassionate history and welcoming people here fleeing persecution. And I want us to always be able to do that as we did in Hong Kong, where that means being in control of illegal migration so people have trust in the system. It means being an active security presence in the region. And our aircraft carrier recently was there. And in partnership with the Australians and the Americans, we have a new defense partnership. And lastly, we need to be thinking about the strategic threats that face us in years and decades to come. We'll all be driving electric vehicles probably one day. That will be wonderful on many levels, but it won't be wonderful if all the rare earth minerals that power the electric batteries all come from China, will it? So we need to be thinking right now, as I was as Chancellor, working with my counterparts in Australia, America, and Canada, to build a supply chain of those critical minerals which is not reliant on China, and we don't leave that too late. So those are all the ingredients that go into countering the threat. But let me just close on this, because it's a broader question about defense spending. Now, look, I was the Chancellor who, together with the Defense Secretary and Prime Minister, put in place the largest uplift in defense spending since the end of the Cold War. And we did that in the middle of the pandemic. We singled them out for special treatment because the threats our country facing were increasing, and we wanted to make sure that the MOD was resourced appropriately for those. Now, if Liz was here, well, when, when was Liz here? I don't know if you asked her, but she would say that she's going to commit to 3% of GDP on defense spending. I'm not going to do that. Right? Defense spending is going to increase. Of course it is, and it will continue to do so. But I don't believe in arbitrary targets when it comes to something as important as security of our realm. So I'll make a different commitment to you, that I will invest whatever it takes to keep you, your families, and our country safe, because that's the first duty of a prime minister, and it's certainly the first duty of a conservative and unionist prime minister. Um, can we go front row, this gentleman here? The microphone is on its way. Hi, Rishi. Adrian Hi. Houston from East Belfast. Um, the, the, this country has uh, some excellent anti-slavery legislation uh, and is against the use of child labour. And you mentioned the, the rare earth metals. Um, my concern is that with the, the government's obsession with net zero and trying to push us all into electric cars, what can you do to ensure that child labour is not being used in Africa, China, etc.? To, to mine the precious metals that are necessary to create the electric cars we're supposed to buy. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's an excellent question, and it's probably something that you're more familiar with than I am. And my understanding is there are a bunch of international conventions that we are a party to that govern the use of child labor in supply chains, not just for, for mining, but in all sorts of other things. Uh, but I'll happily go and look at that, because if there's a particular exposure in in the mining side for rare earth minerals that is not as well covered as, for example, clothing supply chains, which we did a lot of work on over the past 20 years. I'd happily go and take a look at that because ultimately that's something that we all care deeply about and um, all of us share those, share those values. But if I may, you mentioned a, a, a slight uh, point about net zero, <laughs> which I probably should address. Now look, um, I, I believe in net zero, right? I have two young girls and they're 9 and 11, and for the past couple of years, they have not really been bothered at all about the job I've had, with one exception is that they say to me, Daddy, what are you doing about the environment, right? And this big important job you have, that's the only thing they care about. So look, I, I do think it's important, and in the same way that you heard me talk passionately about the public finances and what we leave our kids and our grandkids, I think as conservatives, we care about inheritance in all its 
disguises and part of our inheritance that we leave the next generation is the environment. So I think it's right that we care about it. But you're also right. We need to do it in a way that's pragmatic and that brings people along with us. So my answer to doing that is simple. It's about innovation. Because if we're going to get there in a way that means we're not all just giving everything up that we love doing, that our bills are not endlessly increasing, we need innovation. We need British scientists and researchers and companies to create the products of the future that will help provide clean, reliable, affordable, secure energy for us all to use. And that is happening, right? Hydrogen buses, as I said, on the streets, just here in, in Northern Ireland. That's fantastic. It's a glimpse of what is possible. And we need to do that across the board in solar and new nuclear reactors and offshore wind, you name it. And I'm confident we can do it. Why? Because I know how to build an innovation economy. That's what my business background has been in. And that's when I spent time in California. I know all the ingredients it takes to build an economy that will put innovation at its heart. Because not only do we need to do that to solve net zero, we also need to do that to create jobs and prosperity for every part of our United Kingdom, because that's what modern economies are built on. If you want to drive growth in a modern economy, yes, tax is important, and we can talk about it, and we should, but that is only a bit of the story. In this day and age, if you do not have an economy that is the most innovative in the world, we will not be able to be one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And that is the economy that I know how to build for all of you here in Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom. And that's how we're going to do net zero in a positive way. And that's how we're going to spread jobs and opportunity around our country. So I'm going to go to the gentleman on the end of the row there. Next. Hi, Tiernan Scott, South Belfast. Hi. Um, I just want to ask, what are you going to do for those who are not protected by an energy price cap, whether it be a small business, a pharmacy, a school, a care home? How, they're not protected by a price cap. What are you going to do for them now when their prices and their bills are skyrocketing? Yeah, so, look, well, part of the, the reason is that it gets passed through. So the reason, part of the reason inflation that all of us are seeing is, as of this morning, 10%, is because businesses largely pass on prices through. That's how a market economy works. And the most effective thing for us to do is to help people. Now, look, I think there are some major reforms we need to make to the energy market, right? Now, I'll give you one example again, without getting into the detail, that will reduce wholesale costs for business, all the people you mentioned. And that's in the electricity market. Right now, the price that we pay for electricity and all those people you mentioned pay for electricity is too high. It's artificially inflated. Why? Because think about it. We get electricity from an offshore wind turbine, right? Did anything change in the last year about the cost for that particular business? No, nothing changed. Costs the same to produce the offshore wind this year as it did last year. But the price we're paying for that electricity has quadrupled because we have to pay the price of natural gas, right? That's how our market works. It looks at who's got the highest price. And right now, because of a war, it's natural gas. And then we have to pay everyone else that price. That's not right. And we need to reform our market to break that link. And if we can do that, it will significantly lower wholesale electricity prices for all of the people that you spoke about and all of us. That's a reform that we are behind on. The, Europe has already moved ahead of that. And I want to get on as prime minister and crack on and deliver that. But I will take this other point, if you don't mind, about people, because this is really important. It's the most important issue facing our country in the short term, is how are we going to get through this winter? I think millions of people are at risk of a very tough time. And I've been very clear that my plan is to support them. Now, I believe we have to support vulnerable groups, those on low incomes and pensioners directly with financial support. Because a tax cut does not work for those people. So if you know, Liz's plan is to say, well, I, I believe in tax cuts, not direct support, I don't think that's right. Because her tax cut for someone on her salary means 1,700 pounds of help. For someone working really hard, on the national living wage and the care sector that we talk about, or in, indeed you did, that tax cut is worth about a pound a week. For a pensioner who's not working, that tax cut is worth precisely zero, right? So that's not a plan that I think is right for our country. If we don't directly help those vulnerable groups, those people on the lowest incomes, those people, pensioners, then it will be a moral failure of the conservative government. And I don't think the British people will forgive us for that. And that's not something that I would ever do as Prime Minister because the wrong thing to do. Okay. So we're going to go to the lady here. Put her hand up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane Doherty from Armagh, a relatively new member. 
Welcome, um, Jane. I just want to ask you, uh, hear your answer to a question that was asked to Liz Truss, who is very much on the minds of people of Northern Ireland, is the constant impasse in government and government not sitting in Northern Ireland, or as we call it in our house, strategic huffing. And all these great policies that you've mentioned can't really be put in place effectively if we do not have our government sitting. Mm. So I want to know what specific actions, measures or laws you are going to put in place if you become Prime Minister so that this does not go on. Thank you. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, I think on this, there's, there's probably not an enormous amount of disagreement between me and Liz on this question. I think all of us want to see institutions back up and running, right? That's the right thing for the people of Northern Ireland. And, you know, when we think about how far we've come, right, 25 years next year, right, of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and for this not to be functioning is sad, right? It's not what any of us wanted. It's not what should be happening. And I think there's so much promise. I just, you know, there was a festival just a few months ago that I was reading about, the Four Corners Festival, that brought people from communities together with words from not just the Pope, but also the Archbishop of Canterbury. You can't imagine that happening 25 years ago. So look, there's so much progress that has been made, and we need to make sure that we fix this so that we can continue moving into the future. So look, that starts with fixing the protocol, right? And it also starts with talking to all parties and making sure that we can try and resolve differences and bring people together. That's what I would do as Prime Minister. I'm sure it's what Liz would do as well. Uh, both of us are committed to passing the bill that is in Parliament. But look, you know, as well as I do, that bill will take time, right? That bill will take time to pass. So in the interim, of course, as a new prime minister, I would seek to talk to Europe and Ireland and the French to see if we can find a negotiated outcome. I've got a track record in doing that. I have good relationships with all my counterparts across the board because a negotiated outcome, if it's there, and history shows us that even when Europe say they're not open to changing anything, they have. Because if that negotiated outcome is there, it will be far quicker than waiting for the bill to pass. So it's worth at least trying, but be in no doubt about my resolve to fix the situation with the protocol, which I think will unlock the, the power sharing and bring people back together. Because like all of you, it's right that you know, your institutions are the ones that are taking decisions on your behalf, especially with the challenges that are mounting up, whether it's with your next door neighbor's question about the NHS at the beginning, or social care, or the energy crisis. It's right that we have people here taking decisions for the people of Northern Ireland. That's what you deserve, and that's what I will do my best to deliver. Um, sadly, that's all we have time Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. I hope those of you who haven't already voted, it's given you some food for thought. Can I reiterate the words of... The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. 
the same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united. And the Wakanda villages, as I call them, it is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there. Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, what you were singing? The masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are young boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for Opokuwa. Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. Prepare the world. Prepare the world. Then we go more. Then we will keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then you will sing. Ah, when they tire, tired, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo warriors are winning again. We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How Diplo? Then they will start. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going uh, e levy, e levy, e levy, Kasana, Yakasagana, Ubiarika, e levy, and he says, Me tea bing me. Ni e levy. Because e levy problem, no, a e simple. Now, Ghana government is on Peso or Tiasse, in Tine, a betchimach then. No, what Tiasse ye? It was your fool. Twenty twenty IMF, ma Ghana, one billion dollars. Billion with a B. Same year, no World Bank, ma Ghana, four hundred and thirty million dollars. Nina for COVID. Every year, you know, in twenty twenty one, no IMF for some ma Ghana one billion dollars bill, one billion with a B. Now World Bank for some ma Ghana one hundred and thirty million dollars. In the 20, uh, 2021, no, so I have one billion one hundred and thirty million yeah. If he World Bank buy any IMF buy no, no we say post COVID rejuvenation program say what be ma young economy no so. Into no World Bank ni IMF this is Ghana ma Ghana. Ghana government call Bank of Ghana koyi twenty billion cedis say COVID in the. Ne abu shiyafu World Bank ama mu two billion. Uh, IMF Amamu 2 billion. World Bank Amamu 560 million dollars for COVID. I know on some, Musan call Bank of Ghana Kuyi 20 billion cities. Say COVID in T. Say Sikano will move Hong Kong time trading here. And I will move. We'll move here. Baby, I will be for Ghana. E levy tax. We'll call ports. E levy. We'll call airport. We'll call hotels. Be but they are to be bearer so organa. E levy, e levy, e levy. Says he can hen alpha petrol, e levy. Uko union ma port, e levy. Says he can hen alpha na. Inti se ne. Government a person or chray and say. Ghana fu ebi a yadrun and a year jumentina or de sa e levy nereba. Yes, ye perceive a chray government to say. And yes, a yadrun and year jumo ye who ne'er cosono ni a jay a mano. If you say who per se wunya e levy, young yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, yeah, per se yeah, yeah. 
yeah yeah stand by yet jina hoke ka yet train fire ho or no one can say yes yeah responsible citizens right into yeah responsible citizens na na tin say so who per se would free sika na would the bribia because yen credit rating record former enye yen abrabo na odi e levy ba beto so adenti because there is over 3 almost 3 billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency 3 billion Ghana into it also by 75% what also by 75% i will say by 375 million dollars 375 million save and not at the presidency you don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you, Mr. Kufuado? Any near Koso war presidency? Then now Mudi Sikani a presidency war. Mudi ye then Mudi Shu Sruku and now then now Mudi ye. Legislature, let Ghana legislators. You have two hundred and seventy-five legislators. Then now our legislators no war ye magana. Say say me no mo kase he Ghana fui. You bet me after I install it, Watson, IBM computer, or friend is Watson, no, ah, a artificial intelligence, ah, ebe ye nine over ninety percent of young parliamentarians, no, you bet me replace one with Watson, Watson computer, ben we juma, na yen downscale, ah, then ye here two hundred and seventy five parliamentarians, ah, then we ye magana. One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. And what is the judiciary? Judiciary, hey. America, yeah, 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana, yeah, 30.8 million. America, were nine Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado Banan saying, Ghana near what ten Supreme Court judges? A Kufuado are twenty eight. I can In to say, say Ghana, thirty a per country of less than thirty one million people. No, yeah, what eighteen Supreme Court judges? Then, near how young eighteen? Then, now, I think young now just a cronger will be as in now Ghana and they won't see here Supreme Court judges. Then, ten year old Supreme Court judges. A country of less than thirty one million. 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka, ka, one Supreme Court judge, Biano, liability, every $150,000, 150,000 cities a month. Konako Bunkuntahe, ne V8, ordered them, ne bodyguards, ne, ne driver, ne, 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 uh, 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 ambassadorial post around the world 34 Vatican City ah e wo room kra ye wo ambassador wo ho deng na ambassador wo Vatican City ye magana mon kan kire ye ngem adeng ni e wo ambassadors wo baby to say Malta nom ne eh wo friend deng Sri Lanka se eh Sudan nom ni ade deng o come no ye ne ade ba inti ne ye wo ambassadors wo Sudan it doesn't make any kind of sense so we we e levy. What is this? Yes, some were uh, fifty-eight uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no. Anka hum fasone se we will trade desk a the income commerce a bre Ghana. So diplomatic missions around the world they are fifty-eight. Sika beng wa de bre Ghana. Mung kanchere ye near here. A ye krong waste of money and resource. Musi mu we we e levy. Ye betchira mu se e levy no mung kona mung koyi infi mu amut. For two positions now, we create a whole new fashion. And what now, Munko Yinfi? I think now, more how Ghana for sa MPP for. Then now, Ghana for why Munti? Now the B I N T I S A N T I S A no. Sa positions he now he was he. We were over two thousand executive positions. Sa we were executive benefits and perks. We to kwang we business class. We nya four by four. No money. This how many nice we were Yifi ho. And now what also? And no, no, be ma e levy no income from e levy. You be nye fi ho mroso mroso mroso. Then necessary ye catch re a kufu adu ne wo government. Se sad no munko yi yin fi ho no na mo boka Ghana foka unnecessarily. Na mo be we yi ne we na excavate sa unyangu pan do mi ense yen sangoka 
ni yen nan ne ni emfa nye sika ni emfa nte wo yen yi levi kason mo abeka che nse mo akwashe wo excavators 85 excavators abako ye over 150,000 to 200,000 mo asa akwashe wo na ka ho na pan no no wehi ye edi cup no wehi eh tea no wehi ya anom cup no so awa bona aka ho ei ekufu ado and his government why gana fo ye mpene nde mpene china he live no one hour yes but she one hour no wa quite free scan was a bar yam pen in a lay walk when a yen mo babbe ku ye be jinomu de naming say yer and penny a kufu ado and his government a ding a ding what say when a cluelessness meets unpreparedness no mpp in funny now be home or ya brum we're not gonna take this we're not having this moon fa yam penny net in penny Eleven years here, Munko inko cut legislature, Munko cut executive, Munko cut uh, judiciary. Nasi can ambassadors any uh, were friending uh, uh, ambassadorial post any uh, 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 diplomatic missions. Sani yamani na mung cancel na mung reduce na mung for computers in your legislature say you worth two hundred seventy five. No, you bet me the drone, drone I replace you one. Here 275 at the maximum four per region. Here 64 parliamentarians. Here 211 parliamentarians. No, where liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. Yen Chawong in Fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Yerim Yerim. I want your wedding class symbol. Okay, okay, so when we are the class symbol of knowledge. Strength, adaptability, uh -huh. energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols, when you are a boy, 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 you are it's a free nerd call. So I didn't class him. We who spells him, you know, yeah. I can't in class him. Also, the president is now a free nerd call. Who spells him, you know, yeah. I can't in class him. Also, photo and I didn't class him. Both are failure. You are a failure. You are a failure. And I beg and pay for what we are saying. Yen and Nanuma Motina see here at the Crassem Bos. You see, Mummy and Fawin come. This for the Crassem Bos. Apostle, we have this. Now back to the studio. I'll tell Apostle about this. This is where you want to use your life. Oh my God. You know what? I am a boy. Wakan. Wani. It is a castle. Oh man, you're here, my. Hey! Then I'm a memoir and quiet. Mother. I come to you. 